Okay, so here we go with the uh, second 2.5, second lecture on primordial calls by Professor Bernard Carr and Florian Kindner. There we go. Now you have to accept here and uh, uh, let's. Okay, please, Bernard, the floor is yours. Okay, can people hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. Uh, well, um, I'm delighted to be able to give uh, my second lecture on primordial black holes. Here is a, a, a brief plan for the, my lecture today and, and indeed Florian's lecture. Um, I'm going to first of all continue the discussion of PBH constraints, which Florian begun yesterday. Um, I'm then going to focus on, on more positively on the possibility that PBHs actually divide the dark matter. And I'll make some um, initial comments about that, but then I'll, I'll hand the floor over to Florian, who will be talking in much more detail of, of, a, of a particular natural scenario for PBH formation, which uh, we're going to argue will, will explain um, a number of, of observations, what we call cosmic conundra, and in, that will of course include dark matter itself, which is the prime interest of this, of this school. But then, bearing in mind that most of the audience are particle physicists, who, who might prefer the dark matter to be elementary particles, where Florian is then going to talk about the possibility that you have some combination of primordial black holes and particles providing the dark matter, and then there will be some final points, and I don't quite know how much time we'll have because it depends on uh, how many questions you ask. You're, you're very active in asking questions, which is, which is good, but we have a few final points to make. And, and I will come in again um, then to make some final remarks as well. So um, let's start off then um, continuing the discussion of, of PBH constraints. And uh, I will start by showing the, the, the figure which... Florian showed yesterday, which is a summary of, of the constraints on F, which is the fraction of the dark matter in primordial black holes as a function of mass. And all the coloured regions are excluded uh, with by various observations, and I'll say a little bit more about those observations today. I know that Florian didn't discuss these constraints in great detail, but the point he did stress was that there are there are only a, a few windows, mass windows, where primordial black holes would be allowed to have an appreciable density. He's talked about these already. These are labelled A, B, C, and D. And obviously, if you want the dark matter, in principle, you need F equals 1. So if you believe F had to be 1, it would look as though only A and D are, are possible windows. D isn't a window. I mean, D is the what we, we call the stupendously large black holes, but they obviously couldn't make up the dark matter. They're too big to be in galaxies. So naively, you might think from this diagram, there's only one mass range where F could be one. But as we'll see, uh, you, you should treat that conclusion with, with caution. Can I ask you a quick question, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, so we had previously argued that PBHs can't have a monochromatic mass spectrum. Um, and yet, it seems like we might like to situate all of them in this A range. Are those two ideas compatible with each other? Now, wait a minute. I didn't quite hear you, but I, I think you're referring to the fact that this, this diagram assumes that the black holes have a monochromatic mass function. In other words, that the, the width of the mass function uh, is of order the mass itself. So you do have to treat these limits with caution if you have an extended mass function, and that's one of the caveats. I think, I think actually, Florian stressed the fact that all these constraints have caveats, so you mustn't treat them too, too literally. They, they, all, they could be weakened. Has that answered your question? I think so. I believe previously we had said that um, these PBHs are not allowed to have um, a monochromatic mass function. Um, yeah, that's so, true. Okay. I mean, that, that is, well, it depends. I mean, that in the simplest scenarios, the black holes have a, a, mass width, a mass width, which is of order the mass itself. So if you like, delta N is of order M. 
Um, and in, in that case, this picture is more or less correct. But there are other scenarios in which uh, that isn't true. Now, if, for example, if you form from critical collapse, the map, it's true you have a long tail, but it's still pretty well, uh, it's pretty good to approximate it as monochromatic because most of the mass is at one particular mass. I'm coming on to the extended mass functions later. By the way, can you give me your first name? Because you ask lots of questions and I like to be able to address you. <laughs> Thank you. It's Anne Catherine. Oh, that's quite complicated. I Sorry, know. Jan. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your question. Of now, course, let me thank carry you. On. The point I want to make is that actually this diagram is itself um, taken from another diagram, which I want to show. And this diagram is um, the work which I've done with my Japanese colleagues actually over many years. I spent quite a lot, lot of my life um, compiling the constraints on primordial black holes. So this is a more complicated version of the diagram you've just seen. Again, it plots Fm against n. Um, and it's got the same color coding as before, and it's, it's got all these... Um, it's la the, it, I've labeled the constraints by acronyms. Now, I want to stress that the diagram is far too complicated to absorb, you know, just by looking at it. Um, I, but I'm really showing this diagram to give you an impression of, of really the huge amount of work and effort that has gone into getting constraints. Obviously, we'd rather have positive evidence for black, primordial black holes, but until we've got that, the best thing you can do is to get constraints, because having constraints gives us important uh, information about, about the early universe. Um, and, and so, uh, but I don't want to, for example, I know uh, that the lady who asked questions, she could ask questions about any one of these constraints and it would take me an hour to go through them, but I'm not going to do that now. Um, I think the French are famous because they invented Impressionism within the art movement. And so I'm really showing this diagram from an Impressionistic point of view. If you want to understand the details of this of this diagram in more detail, I, I, would, I would refer you to the notes which um, Florian and myself have provided for the lectures, where these are discussed in more detail. However, I do want to say a little bit about them. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going, I, I should stress incidentally that in the notes, we accidentally included the old version of this diagram. Sorry, there is so a small This question. is the new version. This is the new version of the diagram. Um, these constraints which we're talking about are constantly changing. I mean, every, every week, every day almost, you have another paper coming out which changes them. So if you look over the history of this paper with the Japanese, it's, it's gone through many iterations. This, what I'm showing now, is the, will be the published version. The one in, in the notes was an older version from about a year ago. Sorry but to interrupt. There is a small question on the chat which says, uh, why do you go with to f larger than 1? Oh, good point. Well, the reason for that is, I mean, obviously f can't be larger than 1, but it's interesting because these constraints evolve and they come with, you know, they have error bars, they have sigma error bars and things like that. So it's interesting to see how the constraints will change with time. They, go, they can go up and down. So you're right. Astrophysically, you can never have f bigger than 1, but it's because of the error bars and the evolution of the constraints that we go a bit above that. But that's an important question. Thank you. Now, I thought, though, it would be useful to say a little bit about some of these constraints. So I, what I've done is I'm just going to talk about the lensing and dynamical ones. This is the blow up of the lensing constraints where we've got all the acronyms. And, and just so I, I'm not sort of I, I just don't want to just show pictures. So here's a little bit of explanation of some of these things. The gamma ray B, GRB are the femtolensing constraints of gamma ray bursts. That's to say you have a gamma ray burst and the primordial black hole goes in front of it and it, and it causes a, a change in the luminosity. But the important point is that this is in the mass range 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 14 solar masses. Really small. It's quite amazing in a way that observations can be probing objects that small. But remember, these are they're bigger than the mass which would be evaporating. You can see the mass in grams in the bottom here. So they would still be around. But you'll notice these are dotted lines. And if it's a dotted constraint, that means we no longer believe it. So th these diagrams are partly um, historical. 
So don't the, the, the dotting constraints we no longer worry about. Now the um, the HCS constraint also shown dotted because it's been modified. HSC is the name of the instrument on the Sabaru telescope, and they were looking the, for the microlensing of stars in M31. So the idea is you have a star in M31 and a primordial black hole either in our own halo or the halo of M31 goes in the, across the line of sight and it changes the luminosity. And again, that's put constraints in the mass range 10 to the minus 10 to minus 10 to the minus 5 solar masses. So again, these are very small. Objects this small could only be primordial. So this is the, the dotted line. If you look at the solid line here, I hope you can see my arrowhead the share screen the solid line um is how it, it's been revised so it's a little bit narrower than the dotted line now kepler uh, the by the way can someone say do you see my arrowhead you yes do. we do Great. yeah so kepler um that's the telescope which was actually originally looking for planets but this enables you to look for microlensing of stars in the galaxy and this put constraints in the range 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 3 solar masses. So, again, it's the coloured region which is excluded. Ogle, which is a, a microlensing search, a Polish one, that looks at stars in the galactic bulge. And that puts limits in the range 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 1. These limits just correspond to where the curve hits f equals 1. Now, the old Eros, the, the French microlensing experiment, which goes back to the 90s, that was looking for microlensing of stars in the LMC, in fact, the SMC as well. Sorry, that's the Large Magellanic Cloud. And this is quite a precise limit, and it goes from something like 10 to the minus 7 to 15 solar masses. So this is the limit there. So these are now quite large objects. MACHO, which was the uh, equivalent um, project, um, was looking at a somewhat narrower range, uh, 0.1 to 30 solar masses. So that's also shown, that's the little curve here. Um, more recently, people have looked for the uh, microlensing of supernovae. And there, of course, you're looking, these other searches are looking locally in the galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. This is looking at objects at cosmological distances. And there the limit goes from something like 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 4th solar masses. So that's that line here. Um, and then at much larger scales, we have radio sources. And you've got the millilensing of compact radio sources. Now, uh, the, the distinction between microlensing and millilensing is, is to simply to do with the, if you like, the, it's, the, it's the angular separation of the images, which is in micro arc seconds for microlensing and milli arc seconds for millilensing. So, but again, you're looking for actual changes in luminosity. Um, it's just that the bigger the lens, I don't think we've explained this, but the bigger the lens, the bigger the angular deflection. And so these are the radio sources. So I'm not putting any references in here. All of these limits have got dozens of papers. Um, I refer you to the notes if you want with detailed references. And if any of you have written any of the papers connected with these limits, I apologize for not showing the actual references. There are just too many of them. Our, our reference, the Japanese paper, I think, has got something like 500 references. So it's a, it's, it's a lot of work to read and to write. Now, let me say something about the dynamical limits. Um, again, the green regions are excluded. Um, the, if you've got neutron stars and white dwarfs on the left, these will capture the primordial black holes. Um, and then the, the, black, the primordial black hole, having been captured, may then swallow the neutron star and, and the white dwarf. So the, the, the neutron stars will, will disappear. You know, it, it, so it's, it, it's rather like one of those Jaws movies where the, 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 the shark swallows something and then the, it swallows a, a bomb and the bomb explodes. It's, it's a little bit like that. The neutron star is like the shark which is swallowing the... The, the bomb, which is the primordial black hole. But it's not exploding, of course. It's just the black hole is just swallowing up the neutron star. But again, these limits are shown with dotted lines because we no longer believe them. But it's still very interesting historically. And of course, even if we don't believe them, that means there still is an effect. It's just not as big as we see here. Um, supernovae, 
This, the, this is at low mass also. The, remember, these are going from 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 8 solar masses. So again, sort of asteroid mass range. The idea here is that when a primordial black hole goes through a white dwarf, it can actually trigger a supernova. It makes a shock wave which triggers a supernova. So that's quite dramatic. But again, it's an interesting effect, but the limits probably aren't correct. Uh, we now come to the more secure limits. Why binaries? The idea here is that in our galaxy, we've got these binaries which are very widely separated, which means they're only weakly held together. And if a primordial black hole goes nearby, its tidal field will separate the m components. And so binaries, wide binaries, disappear. And the fact that they still are around gives us this constraint, which goes from 100 to 110 million solar masses, which is shown off there. I'm not going to explain the precise form of the constraint. It sort of falls down and then flattens off. That's described in the notes. Could I ask a quick question about the supernova? Yes, of course. Um, thank you. So uh, is what's happening here... Um, that the, the primordial black hole is emitting Hawking radiation and the Hawking radiation causes the explosion or is it that um, there's like a physical disturbance in, in the white dwarf? Yes. I, thank you for this. Uh, this is, I, I sh all of these black holes are much bigger than um, would be exploding by Hawking evaporation. And you'll notice the mass begins, if you look at the lower axis, it begins at 10 to the 15 grams. So none of these black holes are subject to Hawking radiation. So when I talk about a, an explosion, the black hole causing a supernova explosion, it's not the Hawking explosion. The black hole, in passing through the white dwarf, generates a shock wave which initiates nuclear reactions which causes it to, to explode. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, now, globular clusters, it's rather like the idea with the binaries, only a globular cluster is a gravitationally bound group of stars. If a black hole goes past, its tidal effect will tend to disperse the globular cluster. In fact, what happens is it every time it goes past, it sort of expands the cluster, and eventually it may dis dis disperse it altogether. And so the fact that globular clusters still exist gives us a limit, and that's in the range 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 10th solar masses. So this is this little line here, down here. So we're getting now into large masses, you notice, the mass range which would also apply to non-primordial black holes. An equivalent effect is associated with, with um, it's called Eradinus II. It's a dwarf galaxy, and at the center of this is a star cluster. And if the dark matter in the dwarf galaxy was primordial black holes in a certain mass range, it would disrupt the star cluster. And since it hasn't, that puts constraints on objects in the mass range 100 to a million. So that's this line here. Now, disk heating, we're going up, notice, now in mass. Uh, the idea is if the halo of the black hole, of the ha our halo was, for example, black holes with a million solar masses, it would heat the stars in the disk, and the disk would puff up, and that isn't observed. So that gives an important constraint on black holes in the range of a million to a billion solar masses. So there is the disk heating limit. Um, dynamical friction, if you've got big black holes in the halo of a galaxy, the dynamical friction of the normal halo stars will drag them into the core, and then you get too much of a buildup of black holes in the middle of the galaxy. We know there's a four million solar mass black hole there, but it can't be more than that. And that gives us the constraint here, um, which really goes all, all the way from 10 to the fourth, all the way to 10 to the 12 solar masses. You might ask, why do all these constraints have this uh, diagonal line here? They all, at the right-hand side, they all look like that. That actually corresponds to having one object per galaxy. It's what myself and Florin call the, the incredulity limit. Um, so it's not strictly a dynamic, it's a, it is a dynamical limit, but it's from the requirement. If you would have, if F is so large that you would have less than one of these objects in the halo, obviously the limit doesn't make sense. Now, finally, if you go to even bigger black holes, um, if you look in clusters of dark matter, uh, we know clusters of galaxies have got dark matter. Um, if there were giant black holes of galactic size in clusters, they would induce tidal distortions in the visible galaxies, and that's not observed. And so that's the constraint shown up here, which goes from 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 15 solar masses. Um, 
And finally, on the biggest scale of all, you have what's called the CMB dipole anisotropy. If there were really enormously large black holes in the mass range above 10 to the 18 solar masses, the nearest one, it's a long way away, but it would induce a peculiar velocity simply through its gravitational Coulomb field. And that would induce a dipole uh, moment relative to the microwave background, the CMB. And the fact there's a strict upper limit on the CMB dipole puts a constraint, and that's shown by the diagram on the right here. And so that actually shows there is the cosmological incredulity limit. This actually shows the biggest black hole you could have in principle is about 10 to the 21 solar masses. Um, and you'll notice there is this window here where there are no constraints. This is what we call the stupendously large black hole, the slab range. And it's, as I said, we're not proposing that dark matter's there, but there's nothing in principle to stop there being black holes there. Now, I, I'm not, there are other constraints which go into the, to the Japanese diagram. I'm not going to talk about them. Again, I'm just going to give you an impressionistic view, just so you know they do exist. There is the evaporation constraints. We're not really interested in the evaporation constraints because we're only interested in the dark matter. But I'm just showing that. And then there are also constraints associated with accretion and, indeed, the gravitational waves. But, again, I would refer you to the our notes if you want to read more about those constraints in detail. As I said, there are a huge number of references here which we're not showing. Um, now, um, I want to say a little bit about evaporation constraints, though, because at the moment, um, I, I said they're not really relevant to the dark matter problem. But you'll remember in an earlier lecture, I showed this constraint here, which goes back way to 1994. It was a constraint on beta as a function of m. And I just want to show another picture, which is, again, enormously complicated from the Japanese paper. Don't take in this information. So especially the lady who asked the question, please don't get um, overwhelmed with this diagram. The point of this diagram is, as I said, impressionistic. I just want to convey there are lots and lots of constraints, um, and it represents a lot of work and uh, by many, many people. So notice the mass range goes all the way from 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 17 grams. But because we're only interested in black holes bigger than 10 to the 15, the ones that don't evaporate, I'm going to immediately, this is 2021, just to show, you see, basically, these are the same constraints. So it's in the evaporating range. I'm just trying to show you how they've evolved in, the, in uh, 17 years. But I'm immediately going to hide all the ones there because they're not relevant to, the, to you. You're interested in dark matter. But the ones on the right are relevant because... These are black holes which are still evaporating, but they haven't completed their evaporation. And those black holes are still important. They could, in principle, still be providing the dark matter because they haven't evaporated. So they can produce the gamma ray background, cosmic rays, um, and there are a host of papers on these topics. Now, I'm not going to show, but the point is, what's being constrained here is beta, by the way, not f. Remember, f and beta are simply related. This is a constraint on the collapse fraction. The other previous diagram is the constraint on, on f. However, I've, not, I've decided not to show any paper, specific paper on constraints, because there's just not time to do it. I'm going to make one exception, however, and I want to cite an important paper on evaporations, which I, came I from Macchiao and uh, Budo, and also Marco Sorelli. Now, I'm doing this for two reasons. One, of course, because Marco uh, sorry, can uh, I, can I ask is a quick in charge, question? and, uh, and uh, I just want to <laughs> stress he himself has made an important contribution to the subject. And, uh, and thank you, Marco, for inviting myself and Florian to talk. But actually, the other reason is a sad reason. I don't know how many of you knew Matthew Wadud. Would, would he, uh, he worked with Marco for three years, um, and he was very young, and he, he wrote this particular paper. And sadly, he, he died, I think, in January 2020, just somewhat over a year ago. And it's a sad loss for the field. So it, I just wanted to have a moment's pause just to remember Matthew. And I should also say the last paper I wrote with Florian, um, which was only a few months ago, just before our paper appeared on the, appeared on the, appeared on the, archive, on the archive, and uh, Matthew was the first author. And... Uh, so he beat us to it by one day. 
And so even though he'd already died by then, he's still making a contribution. So really, this is just a, 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 a small tribute to Matthew. Matthew. Anyway, what this diagram is about, it was just showing how uh, Voyager 1 uh, observations have, have measured the positron flux. And, and that you would expect black holes bigger than 10 to the 15 solar masses to generate positrons. And so you get constraints on the fraction of black holes in that mass range from the Voyager 1 observation. Um, um, so I have a quick this question. This is the only specific paper I'm going to, I'm going to talk. Sorry, a comment? Uh, yeah, I have, I have a quick question, just to okay. be clear. Uh, since we show all these plots in um, exclusion limits of fraction of dark matter, um, just to be clear, these are s somewhat synonymous with the uh, exclusion limits on the existence of primordial black holes in general in, in certain mass ranges, right? Yes. Sorry, who is that talking? Here, me. I don't Sorry. know who was saying that, but I don't... Sorry? Me. Hello. <laughs> anyway, not too late. <laughs> I just w I wasn't sure if it was Marco himself talking, that's all. Anyway, let me carry on. Um, a fi another final really complicated... You're probably getting completely overwhelmed with these diagrams, but to be honest, I see them more as works of art because they're really rather beautiful. This is the constraint on beta as a function of mass. This time, again taken from the Japanese paper, this time it goes all the way from the Planck mass to 10 to the 55 solar masses. And this combines all the, all the constraints which come from the, uh, the Japanese paper, you know, on the non-evaporating black holes. The, 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 you know, the paper from the Japanese was non-evaporating ones, and, and then I showed the evaporating constraints. So in some sense, although this diagram is horrendously complicated, it's also hor horrendously beautiful, because it, it, it has all the constraints on beta in one picture. And remember, the key point about this, a point I made right at the beginning, was that only a tiny fraction of the universe can have gone into primordial black holes, and that was the fine-tuning problem. You only expect a tiny fraction of the universe to collapse in most scenarios, but only a small fraction can have collapsed. Okay, so, um, and then just to say that once you have these constraints, you also get constraints on the power spectrum of the fluctuations. I know you've heard quite a lot about the power spectrum from Anne Green and from Florian, and this is a diagram um, that uh, Florian showed, showing how you go from beta to, to constraints, the constraints on beta to the constraints on epsilon, the horizon fluctuations, which is equivalent to the power spectrum. I thought, again, you might be interested in how you can go from the constraints in the, from the Japanese paper on the fraction of dark mass. Remember, this is beta, this is f, but they're, they're simply related by an n to the half factor. If you look at the constraints on the power spectrum, again, this is epsilon, which is the horizon amplitude fluctuation. This is the power spectrum as a function of k. So this, this upper right diagram is equivalent to the upper left, lower right diagram. It's just, this is epsilon as a function of m, this is the power spectrum as a function of k. But the point is that these are equivalent diagrams. And again, I just think this is a rather beautiful diagram because uh, you're using the same color coding. So, um, so anyway, I realize all these diagrams have got a huge amount of information and there's far more information you can take in now. But I just, if you want more details, you can, of course, read the notes which I'm sure you have already read all the notes, which myself and Florian circulated. And indeed, you can read the original Japanese paper if you want even more details. Okay, now, um, uh, I want to make some comments, though, because you're probably getting a little bit worried about all of these constraints. Um, and you might say, well, if myself and Florian, if, if we're so determined to spend our lives working on primordial black holes, um, I mean, I've worked on them for 50 years. Florian is much younger than me. Um, but he's, even Florian has worked on them for probably 10 years. And the question is, um, why, you might say, are we focusing on all these constraints? Because on the face of it, these constraints are nails in the coffin of the primordial black hole uh, scenario. And, and so the, what I want to stress is you should not regard these as nails in a coffin. First of all, all these constraints have caveats. I think Florian showed in one of his slides yesterday that actually 
uh, many of the constraints have gone away. The, the, of the constraints we showed in our 2016 paper, several have gone away. And uh, you remember some of the constraints I showed in my uh, diagram of the Japanese work had dotted lines, meaning there were uncertainties. So all the constraints have gone. Error bars, they may be uncertainties associated with the theory, or they may be uncertainties associated with the ob yeah, observations themselves. Sometimes the observations go away, sometimes the observation stays, but the theory is turns out to have a mistake. And of course, all of the constraints change with time. I mean, obviously, a lot of the constraints, such as the LIGO observations and some of the microlensing observations, we've only had for a few years. Um, oh, but the other point I wanted just to stress this, um, the next slide, um, one of the biggest uncertainties, I mean, for example, you looking naively at the Japanese, when I say the Japanese, I mean that paper I did with the Japanese, you might infer you can't have the dark matter at around a solar mass because the limits seem to exclude F equals 1. However, there's a really important caveat which I want to stress here. All of those lensing observations assume that the black holes aren't clustered. It, they assume they're uniformly distributed. But actually, if the black holes are clustered, strongly clustered within the halo, I mean, obviously they're clustered in the halo, but even within the halo, if they're in subclumps, then the constraints can be very much weakened. Because, for example, if you had, if you had million solar mass clumps and one solar mass PBHs, um, there will be a high chance that you wouldn't be having one of these clumps in, in front of a star anyway. So all the constraints depend upon this. And if, for example, you have a log normal mass function, which um, I think Florian argued for yesterday, the constraints are all changed. And so this is the so the idea is that in many inflationary scenarios this actually happens. So you might expect you're going to get a uniform distribution in the halo, but actually you get clumps like this. And that change, and, and I've just cited one paper by our, our collaborator, uh, Juan Garcia Belido et al., which looks at this problem. So this is it, actually the viability of black holes as one solar mass dark matter candidate crucially depends on whether they're clustered. Um, um, Question? Now, um, let me carry on. The Quick other question point about I that. Say, sorry, a question? Yes, thank you. Um, so with these log normal PBH mass functions, um, would the bubble nucleation scenario lead to that kind of log normal mass function? Yes. Well, now that's quite an interesting question. Let me just go. I don't know. Can I go back? I'm not, oddly enough, I don't think I can go back with this for some reason. Um, Yes, I mean, in the, in, the, in the clustering picture I showed, the black holes themselves have a range of masses. They have a log normal mass function. Um, and so there is a link between whether the P PBHs have got a mass function, an extended mass function, and whether they are clumped. So the two issues do go together. But I'm coming on to the mass function later, so um, let me postpone the question that answer to that question a little bit. Okay, thank you. Now, the other point I, I want to say is that even if primordial black holes have much less than the dark matter density, they can still be enormously interesting. I mean, y there are many interesting problems in astronomy besides the dark matter problem. I mean, for example, the compo you could argue the most important component of the universe is human beings, at least on this planet. But the mass of human beings, their contribution to the dark energy density, is, is completely negligible. And, uh, and this is true in particle physics as well. Um, for example, nobody believes that neutrinos explain the dark matter anymore. At one stage, they were a comp candidate for the dark matter. But we now know they don't make the dark matter, but we also know that neutrinos are incredibly important. <laughs> and there are all sorts of experiments people spend their lives doing in them. And it's like that with primordial black holes. Even if primordial black holes don't explain the dark matter, they can do all sorts of other interesting things. They can, for example, provide the seed for the supermassive black holes in, in the centers of galaxies. And we're going to come on in Florian's talk to discuss other things primordial black holes can do, even if they don't have the dark matter density. Um, um, the other thing is... Um, that every constraint is a potential signature. 
And whenever I talk about a constraint, the original hope was that that constraint, be it lensing or a dynamical effect, might be a signature for black holes. And, and indeed, historically, many of these constraints have been interpreted as signatures. Let me just give you a very simple example about dark matter. Um, I, I've talked about microlensing of dark matter in the LNC or the M31. So the idea is here's a picture. You're looking at a star in the LNC. And if a black hole in the halo gets in the way, then you see a variation in the luminosity, which uh, is an indication of the presence of the, of the dark matter. Now, when this experiment was first done, um, which was in the 1990s, at first they found evidence. I mean, there's going to be some lensing anyway through ordinary stars, but they found an excess of events. And these suggested that, in fact, the dark matter was what they called nachos in those days, a more generic term than primordial black hole, massive compact halo objects, was a mass of about 0.5 solar masses. Now, that was tremendously exciting because... At that stage, people thought it would be quite natural for the black holes, the primordial black holes, to be formed of the QCD phase transition, in which case they would naturally have this mass. And so people like me were really excited. This was way back in 97, I think, because we thought, now at last, we have the evidence that primordial black holes exist. Um, then, and, and also, we expected black holes to form, because as Florian's going to talk about, and has already mentioned, you do expect the pressure to go down at the QCD phase transition. So we also expected primordial black holes perhaps to form then. Later, however, just a few years later, we found that the dark mass in this object could only be 20% of the dark matter density. So that was a bit of a, a blow, a bit of a disappointment. Here is a more precise, this is a, the, the lensing constraint uh, this is the fraction of mass that I was calling f as a function of mass. I've already shown this constraint as part of the, the master constraints diagram, but it might be interesting to show it here. Here is the macho observation, which actually was a positive detection, remember. And we still don't know what those events are. And here were the eros constraints, this region here being excluded. And in particular, you see you can only have about 20%. However, I do want to... So at that point, people said, oh, well, it can't be primordial black holes after all. But I do want to remind you that this all assumes there is no clumping, no clumping of the dark matter. And actually, later on, Florian's going to talk about a scenario where we do want the black dark matter to be in these black holes. And we get round the constraints precisely because they got an extended mass function and there is clumping. And I should say, I should also mention another historical uh, result. Mike Hawkins, um, who's still active, in 93, he was very, he, he was looking at evidence for the microlensing of quasars. So you have a long time scale variation in the quasar luminosity, which he said could be associated with primordial black holes. They're, they're at a cosmological distance, so the time scale is much longer. And he even wrote a book on this um, in 1993. And I have to say, at the time, people, astronomers weren't very convinced by this, but I think now there's more evidence for this. And the only thing is he's now changed his, his favoured mass from 0.1 to one, 1 solar mass. So again, this is historical evidence, which I, I would have represented by a dotted line. I mean, this was not in being used as a constraint. It was being claimed as positive evidence. Wherever you have evidence, you can also interpret it as, as a constraint. So... Um, but then the other point I want to make, which just relates to this um, question, is that generically primordial black holes will have an extended mass function. And all the constraints change if you have an extended mass function. Now, I have to say, this is a slightly complicated discussion, but let me just say, myself and Florian wrote a paper about this in 2016. Um, the question is, can you evade the limits by having an extended mass function? When I say limits, I mean those constraints on FM the, in, the, in the complicated color diagrams. And it, actually, this is a, it's a, it's a two-edged sword in the following sense. Um, first of all, uh, you might think primordial black holes could be dark even if they have a low fraction of mass at any particular scale. I mean, if your black hole 
dots are spread over a huge mass range, they can make up the dark matter even if their density in, in any particular one is low. So you might think that's good news. Um, on the other hand, another problem is that if you have an extended mass scale, that could mean that even if the black holes have the dark matter density you know, in a range which is allowed, it may be with an extended mass function that they're going to violate the constraints at some other mass range, either lower or larger. So it's not completely obvious, when the, certainly when myself and Florian wrote our paper about this, it wasn't completely obvious whether this helped. And now we have a much more precise analysis, um, which is, a, a, this is a, a little bit technical, but you have to, first of all, describe what a mass function, and we do that by introducing a, 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 a function psi as a function of m, which when integrated, of course, just gives you omega pdh. So it is essentially, it's the mass, it's m dn by the m. Um, and you will have heard about various mass functions. There's the log normal mass function, which is being talked about. Often you get a power law mass function, for example, if the black hole is formed from cosmic strings. And Florian's also talked about critical collapse. So these are probably the three most likely mass functions, um, which you've heard about. And in each of these cases, you have to do the analysis. Now, the way you do the analysis, it's a little bit complicated. What you have to do is you, you take the constraints if you have a monochromatic mass function. And the way you do it is your constraint, you have an integral of the constraint, which depends on fm max. And then you have to feed in the fact that you have an expected mass function, uh, which depends upon the fpbh, the dark matter fra fraction. It depends on some characteristic mass, which I'm calling mc. For example, that appears in the log normal mass function. And it, it depends on sigma which is the, the width, the dispersion of the mass function. In all of these cases, you effectively have two parameters. And then what happens is you get a constraint on f as a function of f, mc, and sigma. And this is some work which uh, I, I did with some collaborators in 2017. They, I, 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 that's an old paper. I'm sorry, I'm referring quite a lot to my own papers here, but that, that they're the only ones I understand. Um, now, the, uh, the, the important point is, this is the constraint which you saw before from the Japanese paper. You can't just plot the mass function, because it, that doesn't work. The constraints themselves change. So the FBM constraints themselves change. I'm just showing what happens in the log normal case. And so the constraints change, and then when you do that, you get a limit. This is plotting sigma against m. And the value of f m of f max is, is given by the color here. So, for example, this dotted white line um, corresponds to f equals one. So you see, the analysis is much more complicated. Um, by and large, the and, and I'd refer you to our notes if you want a, 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 a bigger discussion of it. It's quite complicated. This, but by and large, the answer is it doesn't help much. So <laughs> that's probably the bottom line. But um, you, you will need to read the analysis to, to understand this more carefully. Now, um, some final points. Um, um, sorry, this is my next, my final points in the next lecture. So I have now finished. I've taken 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. If anybody, I'm stop sharing my screen unless anyone has some. Uh, points they would like to make, questions we can go, they, we can go straight into Florian. Are you ready, Florian? So unless, unless there are any final questions, I hand the floor over to Florian. Yeah. So I have a kind of uh, general philosophical question. Uh, why do we say primordial black holes don't require new physics, while at the same time we know they cannot be baryonic because they form before BBN? I would say if they are non-baryonic, they somehow require new physics. Well, that's yes, that's interesting. I, I said in my introductory lecture that black holes definitely exist. And so I said in that sense we don't need any b new physics. But it is true, of course, that when you're making primordial black holes, you are depending on new physics. Now, 
It depends what you mean by new physics. If the black holes are forming from inhomogeneities, which in some sense is the most natural scenario, you know, inflationary um, inhomogeneities, in that sense, you're not using new physics. On the other hand, you might say inflation is new physics, because inflation requires you have some inflation, inflaton field, for example, and so that is new physics. Um, if the primordial black holes form from cosmic strings, you're invoking the formation of cosmic strings, so that's new physics as well. Um, and in fact, every scenario, I mean, in fact, I would say the scenario which doesn't require new physics is the one that Florian is going to talk about, which is to do with QCD phase transition, because we do have information on what the QCD phase transition will be like from accelerator experiments. So your question, uh, when I made the argument before that uh, PBHs depend, don't depend on new physics, whereas particle physics dark matter does, you're right, that's oversimplistic, because many of the primordial black hole scenarios do depend on physics which is still untested. At the end of the day, anything one says about the early universe before about a second, well, before the QCD epoch, is speculative and is new physics. So that's a good point. Thank you. Thanks. And Thanks now I think I hand over to Florian, if he's ready. Yes, I am. Right, thanks. He's going to talk about established physics. works fantastic so hello everybody so it's my pleasure to sort of uh, come to this part which is probably my favorite part um, not just because um, because of his Bernard I also that paper <laughs> where we describe the scenario but also it's a very beautiful and we argue very natural scenario and um, about these two points I think I hope I will be convincing so um, let me start. So, but before I go actually to primordial black holes, let us step a little bit back and look how the thermal history of the universe affects, say, the um, number of relativistic particles. So, <coughs> here I put the um, number of um, the effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom, um, and that is a function of temperature. Okay, no, can, can you go, well, I think it's just one step too, maybe, I can't, I can't change, can you do that, yeah, yes, so here we have the temperature and MeV, and here we have the number of, re effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom, so actually time goes from the right of the diagram to the left of the diagram. Now, um, what happens when, when time evolves, the universe cools down. So at the beginning, <coughs> sort of basically all the standard model particles are sort of relativistic, and then the universe cools down, more and more particles become non-relativistic. Let's start with the top quark, this W and Z boson, and all the way down there's pions, and there's then um, the electrons. So you see that there's an evolution and a decline of the relativistic degrees of freedom. Um, but what is the main importance of this for, for our talk is that this actually has an effect on the effective equation of state parameters. So um, in the earlier slide, we called this alpha and later w. So um, w is uh, p over rho, so it's a proportionality constant between um, um, the pressure and the energy density. And in if you had radiation, you would be up at this line. So um, this is just one third on this scale here. Here's w. And this is again the same um, x-axis showing the temperature as it cools down. And whenever you have a drastic change of the effective degrees of freedom, um, you have um, a change in the equation of state parameter. Now, if you remember what I told you, I think in the last two lectures in different, in different times, is that whenever you change the equ um, equation of state parameter, you actually um, change the threshold for primordial black hole formation. So um, in particular, this goes hand in hand with the reduction of pressures. You have several dips, 
where actually the pressure, which makes it difficult to form um, a black hole. So you have, you have two competing forces. You have basically a pressure that is working against a gravitational um, attraction. And so and this, uh, when the pressure is lowered, like in it is the case in the Q around the QCD phase transition, which is around here, um, you would have sort of preferred conditions for forming um, black holes, and that would lead to a larger amount of black holes. And let me just stress one, one fact, is that this the dependence of the abundance of produced primordial black holes on this equation of state parameter is exponential. So you have, um, even though you have only a dip of, say, 10%, um, or probably a bit more, but around 10%, you would change the abundance or the dark matter fraction of primordial black holes by orders of magnitude. And how does it look? So I'm sorry, I can't change the slide. Can I? No. Yeah, so that would look, sorry for the technical problem. Um, so that's um, from a paper um, I've which Bernard mentioned already, um, which, uh, which we work uh, together on with Sebastian Kless and Juan Lucia Belido. This shows um, basically um, or this is a scenario in which you have basically almost scale invariant fluctuations. So you have basically a featureless power spectrum, which, uh, which, have, which has a little tilt. And then what the, this, the, the thermal history of the universe does for you is that, when I go back again, just make it I can't change. Um, uh, anyway, I, uh, you remember the diagram from, from before, um, where around the QCD phase transition, you had a dip in the equation of state parameter, and that dip was about 10%, and you then you can see how sort of that gives a boost around a solar mass. Then you get um, another, another um, a bump that is related uh, to the electroweak um, transition, which, gives, which um, enhances the um, production of primordial black holes around here. And then you have E plus and minus annihilation, which happens later. And later means, you know, as bigger horizon mass. And that means you, you know, sort of produce larger um, black holes, okay? And with this diagram, it actually the integrated dark matter fraction is, uh, the integrated, uh, the total amount of dark matter is, uh, is um, 100%. And we will show you what is really beautiful about this is that you can solve several observational conundrums. First of all, the, the, the most important thing is that <laughs> you can account for all the dark matter, and then you can account for several instances. Of course, this diagram, again, is, is complicated, um, and one important fact is you, you see several different lines in here, and these lines correspond to different spectral indices. So it's the, the, um, the spectrum, the power spectrum, has a simple um, power law form, so k to some power, so, um, and this power is the spectral index. And this spectral index, it's now important, and in a, a priori it has nothing to do with the spectral index you know from measurements of Planck, but it turns out, as a coincidence, uh, only for s values of a spectral index in the narrow range around the one which you measured from Planck, um, which Planck measured, and, and of the WMAP, uh, which is um, point um, 0.97, then you avoid, sort of, I need to click here. Yeah, and so then you avoid either overproduction of, uh, of small, of, 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 of light black holes, because then you see that this, this curve changes here, the, the green curve uh, goes up here, so you have these small black holes um, that are overproduced and then would violate constraints. and. Also, you ha would have an overproduction of large black holes if the spectral index is too small. That means, I mean, we know pretty precisely how much uh, sort of of these very heavy black holes we could have, and um, but with this with this sort of magic magic number of, of 0.97, we could have exactly the right amount um, for se to explain several observational conundra, which I'm now going to um, go into. Now, um, so the thing is. Bernard already mentioned this um, microlensing observation, and um, oh well, I think it's a Polish um, experiment, and so they detected several microlensing events. They have 
a big population which we understand very well of uh, long um, time lensing time scales. So with, with this is microlensing as opposed to strong lensing. So microlensing is just if this if you have a lens um, if you have a source and then the the black hole passes in front of the source, it changes the luminosity and uh, when I say um, time scale, I mean the, the time scale that Lyell's curve varies, okay? And they have a population which you understand very well. Actually, the curve would continue in here. And now, but they also have a population of like short time scale events. So this is time scale of hours. Um, the others are days to almost a year. So but this is time scale of hours. And you, if you look for an explanation of this, then the, the and the standard of the standard repertoire, I mean, let's not put um, primordial black holes yet in the standard repertoire, then the best explanation they could come up is with free floating planets. But actually, the amount of dark matter which you would need, uh, the, amount, the amount of uh, the, the free floating planets which you would need um, to explain this would be a few percent of all the dark matter. So that is, in most scenarios, far too many um, of the floating planets so they actually in the in this paper actually even though they were not coming from sort of from the primordial black hole side they were entertaining the possibility that this um, that these six events which they measured are originating from primordial black holes around um, earth mass yeah so here we have a diagram so um, here uh, it's a dark matter fraction of primordial black holes as a function of mass and here's sort of some excluded region. This gray region is excluded by this HSC experiment, which Bernard mentioned. And um, they said it can very well be in this range. So it's a few percent of the dark matter, um, which could be of primordial black holes, and which could explain this. And actually, in the scenario that, that I showed you before, that, that sort of the, the different curves, um, which you've seen before, is our theoretical prediction for the primordial black hole mass function. Um, this magic choice of this spectral index um, of 0.97 actually yields a few percent of the dark matter in primordial black holes in the planetary mass range. Okay, so this is a one of the bumps we went through. Um, there are a number of different mic other microlensing observations. I won't talk um, too much in depth about these, um, but there's also microlensing um, observations, which let me just click here. Yes. Well, there's is, um, also quasi-microlensing um, events that, that sort of uh, we didn't have really uh, an explanation, a good explanation for in our standard repertoire, but primordial black holes could do this. The same with sort of um, excess of galactic um, of, of um, lenses in the galactic bulge that could also uh, be explained uh, by, by, our, um, by our mass function. Um, then even so, I mean, I'm now going a bit quick. Um, we can talk later on a bit uh, more in depth because there's, um, before the break, there's, uh, sorry? Um, there's quite a bit um, more yet to come. So we, um, there's, of course, more in the notes, and we can discuss this um, more details later on. But um, there's also um, a little bit, uh, not a little bit, there's also some um, correlation, a strong correlation between um, the cosmic infrared and um, the X-ray background. And these could also be um, produced in exactly the same way that is observed by primordial black holes. Then there is um, another thing, sorry for going a little bit quick through this. Um, there, there is also, so when you have these, when I mentioned um, the Eridanus too, and this is an ultra faint dwarf galaxy. And ultra faint dwarf galaxies actually are not observed um, um, below a certain radius. And, and primordial black holes could be a reason why these objects are actually unstable, why they are uh, dissolved. Now, after going a bit quick through through um, these sort of these conundra, um, let me uh, elaborate a bit more in detail about uh, probably one of these conundra. Florian, you've got you've got plenty of time, Florian, so you don't have to rush. Yeah. Well, let me let me come back to to the other conundra later. Let me explain this, and let's see how much time we we have later. So. Um, Okay, so, and one of the major predictions of, of, our, um, of our model, and where of actually the biggest peak is that you see, here's again our mass function um, our, uh, of, the, of the, the prediction for the primordial black hole dark matter fraction. Um, you see that this is actually here, so this big peak, and sort of 
this what's called the Payam Plateau, um, they are in a very sort of interesting range, which is in the range which LIGO and Virgo and probably Kekra can, ac can access. Now, before, um, so the first version, the archive version of our paper, that when it came out, there were no, no O3 events. And so we made a prediction um, of this is here, and on this diagram we have the, the masses of the two merging black holes uh, that, and, uh, that sort of could merge, and the, the detection likelihood is um, given here with the color coding, so um, the, the brighter the color is, the more likely is the detection. And so we predicted sort of basically three regions where you, so where you should uh, be able to detect, or in the future we should see mergers detected with LIGO if our model is right. Now, and so our in the process when we sort of, when we were um, publishing and, and, you know, going through the review process uh, for our paper, in the meantime, actually three events, LIGO events appeared. And um, this is sort of one event, um, I mean, three, one event which is actually at very low um, masses. One has a very low mass ratio because we predict also unequal mass ratio. It's basically, so you have this, this big peak around the solar mass, a peak around a bit more than 10 solar masses. So if these, or of order 10 solar masses, so if these two sort of um, merge, you should get this um, low mass ratio merges. And of course you see that um, our distribution extends to, to larger masses. So that would actually lead to um, very heavy black holes. And um, so now people, uh, or some researchers, uh, which sort of looked at how much, how heavy black holes um, can be from at the end products of uh, uh, stellar evolution. Um, at the beginning was thought, well, probably so 80 or, or even 60 solar masses only are the maximum. And now they're revising models and they come up with sort of prediction for even around 80 solar masses. But we predict actually masses in, in this mass range and you don't need to change any, any, any stellar evolution model. And we actually would, our scenario predict an even a, a large population um, in, in this range. So here we, we should see in the future, hopefully with O3b or the O4 run of LIGO, we should, m we should see many more um, mergers and also like the, the small ones. And probably the biggest, uh, the I would say probably the, the most smoky of the smoking guns is, um, would be the black holes sort of in the very low mass range, in particular uh, those that sort of reach um, even below a solar mass, because that is certainly not a product of, of, of a stellar evolution. But even, even a solar mass is difficult to produce. I mean, usually in this mass range, um, you would look for um, Newton stars. So probably above five-ish solar masses, you would, you would only think, or traditionally you would only think that this, this is black holes. Um, but the primordial black holes, of course, they are not subject to this, this mass gap. They could fill all the mass gap, and we predict that they should actually fill this mass gap and we should see um, a larger population also in this mass range. Now, of course, you know, above this, this sort of this mass gap, say above sort of five-ish solar masses, um, these black holes could have been a result of stellar evolution. And then the question is, is there a way to discriminate or at least a way to be more convinced that this could be of primordial origin? And one interesting prediction for primordial black holes, at least in, in, many, in our scenario and in many scenarios, not for all scenarios, but for a large class of scenarios, including ours, with this, this extended mass function with the different bumps, is that basically the expected spin which, which these objects have um, should be rather low. So there's a nice theoretical work by Tobata and Yokoyama who predicted the spin distribution. So A is a spin parameter, so A equal to one means maximal spinning, basically, and so here you see that this is peaked around, around zero. So primordial black holes basically shouldn't spin in most scenarios, I have to say. Of course, there are other scenarios, but in our scenarios, they shouldn't really spin much. And when you look at the effective spin parameter, so this chi f, so chi f is basically a weighted projection um, of the individual spins, so the, the individual spins are called s, 
to S, um, say SJ, for J being um, one or two, for the two merging masses. So you have um, the spin over the masses, so S, S, um, S1 over S2 plus um, um, uh, so time, um, scalar product with S2 over M2, and this is projected on the onto the um, total angular momentum. Now, and of course, there's different ways to produce this effective spin um, parameter, also to it uh, arranged in a particular way um, to zero, but this you wouldn't expect really. But what is measured, what has been measured with uh, LIGO, um, is for a number of events, I think now we would have even more, but this is um, a longer list of the, of the measured uh, value for the effective spin parameter, which is basically as either consistent with zero or with very little spin. You see, and you see it's large error bars, yes, because it's, I mean, it's easy or relatively easy to say what the final spin is, but it's um, a bit more complicated to deduce from the observation the individual spins. That's why the error bars are quite large. But you, but you really notice that um, this is, most of them are centered around zero or are not very far away from zero. So, of course, this is not a proof for, um, you know, that these black holes that we measured, these mergers that LIGO measured are from modular uh, nature, but they are actually in, um, um, this is in line. I th see a question over there? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. I was just wondering, so why are, why are the spins expected to be low? So what is the reason, the physical reason for that? So, I mean, I mean <coughs> this is, this scenario which we discussed, yeah, or which which we which I, I showed you, which is different bumps. It's also a scenario which sort of originates from you can I mean there's different um, sort of very basic scenarios you, you can write down, but essentially it's uh, it's this inflationary perturbations and you have this large overdensity sort of that at some point sort of fits into the horizon. You have something which is sort of you start non spinning. And then you have a gravitational collapse to a black hole. So at some point, it, these overdensities can can uh, come in causal contact and can um, undergo um, a collapse process, and they start basically non-spinning. And of course, you may have small perturbations, and also on the way, it's like the ice skate. I mean, you have tiny perturbation that can speed up a little bit, but actually, you would not expect to have a large spin by this process. You start with something something very big, non-spinning. So at the beginning, it doesn't doesn't um, the, the initial overdensity that's collapsing sort of sometimes it is irrotational and then sort of you, you get a collapse from that. I mean, it's the story. Uh, if you want uh, to trace it, really Florian, could yes. I, Florian, could I just interject just uh, to please. explain it again? Uh, the the point is these overdense regions they come in the horizon, they stop expanding, and they don't collapse much before forming black holes. They have to be close to the horizon size, so they don't have to collapse very much at all before forming a black hole. Whereas the black hole which forms from stellar collapse, it starts from a, you have a cloud which is collapsing an enormous amount. So it spins up. So that, that's the reason why the primordial black holes don't have spin, whereas the stars do. Sorry, Florian, over to you again. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, this is something that, like I said, this is uh, in, in sort of, indication that tells you um, we are not uh, totally off. Of course, if, if, you, if this KF would be um, telling you that the individual spins were really, really large, and probably that would speak against our scenario, but so far we are, uh, we are um, sort of a little bit back up by this observation. Now, if you go to the larger side of the, of the um, different, um, different bumps, we have this mass spectrum actually in the, um, uh, in this sort of, around 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar mass range, or even or in, or in a range around these, these masses, uh, you have black holes that are actually very good seeds for the supermassive black holes in galactic centers. I mean, so far it's, it's a question in astrophysics, um, also how to produce, like for instance, from, uh, from stellar collapse, from a star that has probably 50 solar masses or even 100 solar masses that collapses to a black hole, how to produce or how to then end up with a black hole of a million, a billion or 10 billion solar masses. So you have, of course, you have, you can have, um, you will have growth, but it's still 
a bit challenging to go to these enormous masses. And of course, these primordial black holes, which are already quite heavy, say as 100,000, a million solar masses from the start, they would be um, providing quite a there would be quite good seeds for these for these um, supermassive black holes in galactic centers. And actually, when you um, you know when you look at a relation between the observed sort of the black hole, the mass of a black hole, which is shown uh, shown here, and the mass of sort of the uh, uh, the galaxy which they are sitting in, then um, you sort of there's there's sort of a relation of the different population that we see. And actually, our model um, can also sort of um, explain this is this relation between these, um, you know, the mass of the black hole and sort of the galaxy which is hosted. Now, um, let me go to actually probably the, the topic where which sort of um, brings together um, the discussion on primordial black holes and probably the research activity of most um, um, attendants of the, um, or most participants of this um, school. And Basically, so Bernard showed you, and uh, me too, we showed you a lot of constraints um, on primordial black holes. And you may ask, okay, what if primordial black holes do not form the entirety of the dark matter? Um, what is the rest? I mean, inevitably, if primordial black holes are part of the dark matter but not providing all of it, there must be something else. And of course, what this something else is is a question you may ask. And um, one sort of reasonable assumption you can do is sort of you have a combined dark matter scenario um, exist, um, consisting of uh, primordial black holes and particles. So when you have, and these particles, of course, they could, could be WIMPs, but whenever you have such a scenario, what would happen since the primordial black holes are around for a very long time? Um, and you have, so sort of they are in an environment of, um, other dark matter particles, these other dark matter particles would be gravitational bound and build up a halo around these primordial black holes. And so actually what is then a good way to constrain these scenarios, or to probably look for these scenarios, is to look for sort of annihilation thicknesses. I mean, the point is that the annihilation rate to WIMP scales like the square of the number density. That means if you have a halo, so you have pr probably a more or less uniform um, WIMP distribution, or at least not as large over density as you have around these primordial black holes. You can have a pretty get pretty strong density spikes, and we'll show you later sort of um, how these spikes look. And we made a simulation to, to, to see um, really um, how the profile is. But then you would have sort of a large enhancement of the annihilation rate. So this is, this is the, um, the physics for, for detecting this, and actually what sort of there's, there's the program, so which we did. So first of all, um, you know, or, or what many people did, it's not, not us, I mean, it's, it dates back um, several years, where people calculated um, the, the density profile of the WIMS captured around, uh, captured by the primordial black holes. Then you can calculate, the, uh, once you know this, you can calculate the annihilation rate. And of course, then you can compare the, this signatures to what is observed, say by Fermi, um, what is observed in terms of the electric, um, um, the, uh, sort of the extragalactic gamma ray background. And so the first step in this list was to come up with a profile. It's now complicated diagrams. Again, uh, it's not as complicated as uh, these big master constraint diagrams, but still it's a bit cluttered. So also, uh, you know, don't try to uh, grasp everything uh, immediately. So. Um, here we have the dark matter density around the primordial black holes as a function of radius. And th there's two types of lines, basically. Um, so let's focus just on, on one, uh, uh, one color. So let's see the, uh, the different, this is here for, say, this green line is for, um, oh no, this, this, this lower line, this, these three lower lines are for, uh, say, black holes of uh, 10 to minus 12 um, s solar masses. So this is actually uh, very light black holes, and you can have um, sort of Earth mass black holes, and then you have black holes of, of, a, of a solar mass and a, ten and a million mass uh, black holes. But so these the different line types in terms of a solid and a dash mean that the solid lines are sort of the, the, the sort of more or less initial or older profiles, and the dashed line are the profiles that we would have today. 
And you see a stark difference here, and in particular you see a plateau. And the plateau comes from annihilation. So over the course of time, if the energy, if the, um, the density of these dark matter particles or the wind particles is large enough, they would, they would annihilate. So they would, would shrink these densities, so you get actually a plateau. So each of these moles at some time will have a plateau and then a, a power law fall off. There's a number of, you know, there's different, different um, um, uh, form of the, uh, at each, I mean, at different stages um, in, in, in um, length or in, in distance from the center where you get different power laws, but let's not, let's not go into details, but the, the main thing is here to get a plateau, basically, from WIMP annihilation, and then you get an exponential fall off. And sorry, uh, Florian, yes. can I just interrupt? Yeah, please. Um, if, if you could show the figure again. Yes. <coughs> I just want to point out that uh, we've cited our own paper there, but I have to say that one day before our paper appeared on the archive, um, a, a paper appeared with um, basically the same uh, profiles as we've got here, and that was the paper by uh, Matthew, Matthew Badood and his colleagues. And so... Uh, uh, we were very uh, well. Um, th they actually beat us to these profiles by one day, and we worked on this problem for six months and found it very hard. So, that that l what I think is probably the last paper by Matthew was really impressive, and it and it just it came in just before us. So, uh, I just wanted to mention that as a tribute to Matthew. Uh, Over to you again. Uh, yeah. So, uh, with this situation where you're looking at these density profiles and the annihilation leads to this more core profile today. Why is this unique to having primordial black holes? Um, well, I mean, th these, well, you need some sort of, I mean, they, the whims are sort of captured by some, some massive object. We need, I mean, to, in order to capture these whims, you need some, um, I mean, need something that gravitationally attracts them. Of course, if you have some uh, from another theory, some other probably exotic microscopic um, candidate or microscopic body that attracts these um, these whims. You, you can also build up a halo ar around them. So in this sense, it's probably not too specific. I mean, of course, if you look very closely and you, there's ways to discriminate this, but but in principle, um, you you need a massive, a very massive body, a compact body in the center, and and over time, uh, more and more whims will be captured and build up this halo, and then there's a dynamics to sort of uh, plateau the the center. Okay, so in other situations, you just don't build up a high enough density. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you need you need something uh, which which I mean, to build up this halo, you need to have some gravitational uh, attraction, and um, the black holes do this naturally. But of course, if you have, I mean, there's other sc scenarios which have say of microscopic bodies of nuclear density. I think there's a paper by Dan Starkman on sort of microscopic dark matter, which is not primordial black hole. And uh, there's another field which is. Uh, a bit different, there's these, um, it's called ultra compact mini halos. So if you have density fluctuations that are not large enough to form primordial black holes, but yet they could form some uh, very compact structures and you have also some sort of halo profile. Yes, if this is indeed the formation of halo profiles is not um, unique to primordial black holes. You have other situations, but of course, when you look very close into this and when you, s uh, when you study very detailed this, um, this sort of, the the fall off and the signatures, I think you could um, discriminate some of these scenarios. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, and that's actually um, later on, and from, of course, from comparing the predicted signal, so the predicted annihilation signal to the exotactic gamma ray background, um, you can actually draw some, um, not the sum, you can draw very tight constraints. So. Here we have again the primordial black hole dark matter fraction as a function of mass, and everything above these lines is sort of excluded. And so here's these very light ones, the evaporating ones, or the, uh, some other constraints which we had before. Here's the incredulity limit, which were not mentioned, which basically corresponds to one in the environment. But let's not talk about these so much. Let's um, focus on these blue lines. Now, with these with this blue lines, it's, it's just assumed you have sort of a standard WIMP of a certain certain mass, like a TeV, 100 GeV, or 10 GeV, and you look for the annihilation rate. Of course, it is, is uh, depending on, uh, on the values of the annihilation cross-section. I have later on a slide where we actually show sort of 
where we go through the different uh, parameters. We have a more sort of um, complete diagram. But already here you see that the abundance, the, uh, in particular in this for this not tiny black holes, for this sort of the, the, the black holes which are sort of above, say, 10 to minus 6 solar masses or so, uh, you have this, this plateau, and that is actually tiny. You see the allowed dark matter abundance dark matter fraction of primordial black holes uh, is, uh, if you have this WIMP scenario, um, so it's primordial black hole and WIMP scenario, is tiny. And actually it's so tiny that, so if you then assume if you go the other way around and say, okay, if the primordial black holes observed by LIGO, uh, sorry, if the black, sorry, if the black holes observed by LIGO are primordial in nature, um, of course that would imply that you are not down here, you're probably around uh, um, you know, a, a percent, a per mil, or in, in that range you're up here. This would rule out any standard WIMP scenario. So this is quite powerful to constrain or to rule out um, a scenario. I mean, it goes vice versa. I mean, of course, you, if, you, if you one day detected um, uh, measured WIMP somewhere, you could heavily constrain the primordial black hole uh, fraction. I mean, it goes, goes in both ways, but if you have these combined scenarios, it's it's you have super strong constraints. Yes, please. I say, how many detections do you need? I mean, how many how many primordial black holes do you need to detect to actually like rule out the wind scenario? Is it just one, or is it many? One. I think just I think it, right, it, right, if you if you know that this this black hole which which you detected with LIGO is primordial. Um, since given sort of the detector range, and, and I mean, of course, it can be super unlucky, but it, in, in, you know, usually when, when if these, if the black holes, the few black holes which we detected with, with LIGO, um, if they're of primordial nature, you would have, th that would imply sort of a dark matter fraction which is significantly above um, 10 to minus 11. I mean, significantly above. So you don't need many. Um, in principle, if, if you know that there's this, this one, you would, um, it would basically be enough because th that can only happen realistically if the dark matter fraction is is uh, far above these numbers. Oh, okay, so but even at the low, like the v not all masses are like you go you detect one black hole at one mass that will constrain like one lie on this plot. I mean, how do you dispute the fact that there could be other masses for the the wimp? I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's well, th there's <laughs> this this constraint. Um, it's for different, like I said, I, mean, ha I have a later on a, a strong constraint, but, but here, um, if you have, say, a WIMP of, of whatever, um, 100 GB, that's the middle line here, yeah? <laughs> and for any black hole, um, if you take the middle line from, say, 10 to minus 6 or so till, well, whatever, arbitrary large masses, um, these, these constraints um, are, um, you know, are so strong as, as indicated here. I mean, it's... Um, of course, if you change the wind mass, you go. Um, so if you if you um, increase the wind mass, you go up with these lines. But you have to. You see, you have to go up. Um, if you want to be um, ending up somewhere in this range here, where you have just uh, a per mil, say, of of um, of the black hole, say, if you know which, which is sort of the range um, um, for for the LIGO black holes to be the minimal range for the LIGO black holes to be um, the dark matter, then you would have to crank up the wind mass quite a bit. I have another plot which clarifies this, so let me just go to this before um, we go to Bernard's final remarks. So um, this is now a more, a plot which probably goes more into answering your question or probably gives a bit more um, insights in this direction. So here we have the wind mass as a function uh, in terms of in, in units of GV. Here we have the primordial black hole mass or masses in terms of um, in units of the solar mass. From this is from 10 to minus 14 to um, 100, um, and this um, the wind mass goes from um, 10 GeV to a TeV, and here you see the allowed uh, dark um, um, the allowed wind fraction. And actually here, this is in this model we have that. Um, so if you have if you have the allowed um, wind fraction, um, then this plus the um, in, in for this plot to generate was wind plus primordial black holes equal to equal to one. So, I mean, you can have, of course, a situation, I mean, of, like I said, uh, uh, to say, uh, again, what I really want to say below this, that, I mean, for each, I mean, for each, th there's, there's for small values of FPBH, then we have really heavy constraints on the WIMP dark matter fraction. And actually, what we point out to so our paper is um, 
so our paper is called, um, uh, so I think it's primarily black holes, um, WIMS, or something else. So actually, um, all this observation may also point you to yet another uh, dark matter candidate, because, um, you know, if, if you look at this, this, this plot, I mean, for primordial black holes, larger than this, um, this 10 to minus 11 solar masses, and WIMPs smaller than, than um, 100 GV, I mean, both the primordial black hole dark matter fraction as well as the WIMP dark matter fraction can only be 10%. So this, in, in, for thi in this case, you are pointed to either abandon this scenario of the standard WIMPs because it's sort of, you can sh modify this WIMP scenario, or you yet have another um, dark matter. Can, um, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So I guess all this assumes dark matter annihilate through S wave. Uh, does yeah. it change a lot if we assume it annihilates through P wave? It it would change the graph, uh, the graph definitely. Um, so I'm I must say I must I have to um, you know look in this to, uh, into this more carefully. But I, I th you're right. I mean this this is un under this assumption which you mentioned, and. Um, if you change from the sort of the standard assumption, you change it. But even if you also look at the annihilation cross section, um, they, this assumes a certain annihilation cross section, a certain value. If you change this quite a bit, you can, I mean, you can make this constraint go away by, by making the annihilation cross section very, very low. Um, so, in this sense, like I said, you have to, if you deviate from sort of the standard assumptions, um, you change this constraint. By exactly how much, I'm not quite sure. I don't want really to say anything wrong. So uh, we, we can discuss it later together. And we can go um, to the paper and, and probably do some calculation and, and have a look how this, in which direction it goes. But um, the bottom line is the standard WIMP scenarios and primordial black holes are really heavily constrained. So and with this in the remaining uh, minutes, I think um, we come back to Bernard. So hand over to you, Bernard. Th thank you, Florian. Um, so if you could, I will share screen, if you could stop sharing ah, the yes, screen. Yes, let, let me unshare. Can you do it? Yeah. Okay, you've unshared. Yes. Thank you. So I will share the screen again. Um, so I will, um, here we go. So I'm on, can everybody see my screen again? I just want to uh, uh, make some final points. Have I got five minutes, Marco? Thank you. So um, the first point, I just want to come back to a point which I raised in my introductory lecture, which is the, the fine tuning which is required to, for PBHs to explain the dark matter. You, you remember that it's only a tiny fraction of the universe what had gone into primordial black holes, even if they make up the dark mass. Um, and for example, if the black holes form at some time t, we know what their mass is, and uh, it, we also know what the, the value of beta is, the collapse fraction, if we know what the dark matter fraction, fm, is. And this, this is just to remind you of the actual relationships, um, the dependencies on m itself. Now, so beta is fine-tuned. However, I'm, we're particularly interested in the situation in which the primordial black holes form at the QCD phase transition. Remember, this was the scenario which, which Florian uh, described in, in the last lecture. Now, it's very interesting that uh, one thing you've got to ask is, well, what is the ratio of the PBH density to the baryonic density? Beta stands for baryons. And you remember in the first lecture I, I showed Nuclear synthesis tells us what the baryonic density is. It's about 5% of the critical density, whereas the dark matter density is about 25%. So in actual fact, this parameter chi, which is defined by this relationship, is basically six times F, where F is the dark matter fraction. So that's a number of order one. And actually, that is a strange coincidence. Why should primordial black holes have roughly the same density as the baryons? The ratio, more precisely, it's six. And that's a mystery. That's a, a deeper level of fine-tuning. We know beta's small, but we need to explain this. Um, but there are sorts of reasons why we know it has to be the case that chi isn't too different from one. If chi was much bigger than one, that would mean there are lots and lots of primordial black holes. That would mean that the, uh, 
the time at which matter dominates the density, what we call T ek, begins to dominate over radiation, will be much less than the decoupling time, which is when you see the microwave background. And in that case, there wouldn't be enough baryons left to make galaxies. On the other hand, if chi was much less than one, in other words, if we didn't have the dark matter, um, uh, sorry, this should be T ek, not T dec. T ek would be much bigger than T decoupling. Um, and that would mean the fluctuations would be too small to make galaxies because basically fluctuations can grow in the dark matter between T ek and D dec. So if T ek is after D dec, that doesn't happen. So you do need dark matter to make galaxies given the size of the initial fluctuations. Of course, it, it could still be particle dark matter. Um, but, but now the point is, so in other words, what I'm saying is that if you do think the dark matter is made of primordial black holes, chi can't be too large and it can't be too small. Now, if black holes form at the QCD epoch, which is the scenario which uh, we rather like and Florian talked about, then naturally speaking, the mass is of order what is called the Chandrasekhar mass, which is basically a one solar mass. The Chandrasekhar mass is the mass associated with white dwarfs. It's 1.4 solar masses. But what's also interesting is that beta m, the fraction of the universe collapsing, is necessarily uh, eta, which is the baryon to photon ratio, which is a, an important cosmological parameter, which is 10 to the minus 9. It's the baryon asymmetry, the, the asymmetry between matter and antimatter, so that when the matter and the antimatter annihilate at the QCD epoch, you get the asymmetry turning into the photon to baryon ratio. And so what is the fine-tuning problem then comes down to why is beta the same as eta? And um, so basically then, the, the question is, First of all, dark matter and visible baryons have similar mass, but also this raises the question, could the baryons actually generate the baryon asymmetry? Normally speaking, you assume the baryon asymmetry is associated with grand unified theory processes at a much earlier epoch. But this suggests that maybe in some way the black holes actually generate the baryon asymmetry. And now, here is the way we think it can happen. So this is a, another paper with uh, Juan Garcia Bolido and, and Sebastian Kless. And the idea is this, is that when we focused on a black hole forming, you have an overdense region which collapses and forms a black hole because it's almost in its Schwarzschild radius even when it stops expanding if it has an overdensity of, of water one. This is incidentally... Uh, why black holes don't spin, because they don't have to collapse much before they fall inside their Schwarzschild radius. But the point is that when you form a black hole, there's also the matter outside the black hole is expelled outwards. So the, the, as the matter collapses, it releases gravitational potential energy into a shell of matter which expands. So although we've not mentioned this so far, you, you actually, the formation of a black hole forms an expanding shell. So it's rather like a, a supernova, except it's a primordial supernova. And when you look at this shell, the temperature is so high that you can have baryosynthesis occurring. You have what are called C and CP violation processes occurring, even in the standard model, what's called the CKM model. Um, now, this is rather technical, and, and it depends on the fact that you are out of thermal equilibrium, which is important for all the baryosynthesis models. But basically what happens is that the, um, the predicted asymmetry, remember chi is the, is the ratio of the PBH density to baryonic density, it depends on the parameter gamma. Now, I haven't defined gamma here, but gamma is the size of the region relative to the, horizon, the cosmological horizon set. Size. So it's a parameter which we know has to be of order 1, but this ratio is automatically of order 5 if gamma is 0.18. So that's saying as long as the size of the black hole is, which in theory is predicted, if it's right, then you're going to get, um, you'll explain the black hole to baryon ratio. But then the question is, well, why uh, is beta Bernard, eta? Bernard, just and the to reason let you know, is very simple. We should wrap up at some point because we have lunch. Yeah, I, I've got okay, just thank one you. minute to go, to two minutes to go. Okay. And the reason is very simple because locally you're generating a baryon asymmetry of order one.
But if the collapse fraction is beta, then by the time the, the baryons are diffused throughout the universe, you automatically have a, ba a cosmological baryon asymmetry of order beta. Um, and so to, uh, we found this a remarkably beautiful idea. And maybe ba uh, Florian can say more about this later. If you naturally explain the baryon asymmetry as arising from the primordial black holes, and then the fine-tuning problem has gone away. Now, with that, I want to come to my concluding remarks. First of all, stressing the relationship from between PBHs and WIMPs from a historical perspective, you've seen this very complicated diagram on beta m. And the point I try to stress is that this diagram is constantly evolving. And I like to make the analogy between fm and the particle that I'm sure you've seen lots of diagrams like the one on the right, which is the WIMP mass against the, the, the WIMP cross-section versus the WIMP mass. And so, you know, it, sometimes one might think of this uh, as a rivalry between the PBH enthusiasts and the WIMP enthusiasts, but both topics have gone through a very similar historical progression. As our observational sensitivity increases for PBHs, these WIMPs, these limits become stronger. And it's the same with particle physics. The, the, you know, you get these lower boundaries which come from the particle physics experiments. And it's very similar. And what I would like to say is, um, I don't think of us as rivals. I mean, obviously, most of you are probably coming from the particle physics side. But really, as f from my point of view, we, m we need both forms of dark matter. I don't know which of these candidates is primarily going to make up the dark matter, but both candidates are interesting whether or not they make up the dark matter. I hope that message has come across. Um, you just have to wait and see. Um, and I just want to end up uh, by giving you a, a, a sort of one-minute summary of the history of primordial black holes because I, I find it rather fascinating. I've worked in the subject for uh, 50 years. Florian has worked in it for... Uh, I don't know, Florian, less time, um, less than 10 years even. But let me just give you a brief history of, of the subject. Popularity doesn't mean much. You can interpret popularity in terms of the, the black hole um, publication rate, if you like. Um, so it started with Hawking's paper in 71, forming for the inhomogeneities. There was interest in them forming the QCD phase transition in 1982. I didn't talk about that specific paper. Then we had the microlensing observations of quasars. Hawkins, you recall, Mike Hawkins was arguing that that was evidence. Then we had the macho results, which um, gave an initial excitement when they seemed to get evidence for these black holes. But then it went away a bit. Um, at, well, then it was realized that they could form at the QCD phase transition, so popularity increased. Then it decreased when we discovered that the microlensing observations actually only seemed to allow... 20% uh, of the dark matter. But then um, people started realizing that there were these other ranges in which you could have sublunar black holes or intermediate mass robbers explaining other observations. I haven't talked about it, but it's conceivable, actually, that the evaporating black holes leave stable Planck mass relics, in which case the dark matter could be Planck mass relics, which are in some sense particles rather than black holes. We haven't talked about that, maybe in the discussion sessions that will come up. Um, but then, um, again, then there was a decrease when all these dynamical and accretion limits came out. So people thought, well, maybe it can't be the dark matter anyway. But now, of course, we've had the LIGO results, and uh, I should say LIGO-Virgo results. And those are what have really, I would say, prompted interest in primordial black holes. Um, but at least I'm glad to be able to end this uh, our talk on a high. Um, and, and I would just like to finally thank, first of all, I'd like to thank Marco and all the organisers for inviting us to talk because, you know, not everyone is keen to hear about primordial black holes if they work in, in particle dark matter. So we much appreciate, myself and Florian, have much appreciated the opportunity to, to present the case for primordial black holes. So thank you to, to Marco and, and all the other organisers. And I would also like to thank um, Florian my collaborate, friend and collaborator, because originally I was going to give these talks on my own, but, you know, the English, I'm afraid, aren't allowed to come to France, or at least it's rather complicated to come to France because of the pandemic. So um, at relatively short notice, um, Florian uh, agreed to come and give half the lectures on my behalf in person. So thank you very much, and I know to Florian, and I know all of you, um, 
also appreciated Florence being there because I know he's talking to a lot of you outside the lectures. And finally, of course, thank you to all the students for um, uh, listening to these lectures. And I hope some of you at least will become interested enough in primordial black holes to contribute to the subject. And so with that, thank you on behalf of myself and Florian. I've now finished and I'll stop sharing. Thank, thank you, actually, on our part, too. Thank you very much to both speakers, <laughs> Bernard and Florian. It's been very good. Thanks. So thank you very much.